This is a podcast from The Bugle. A dark night, a quiet country road, a car sits idling. There's no sign of its driver. Somewhere a cow moos ambiguously. Above, an impossible silver disc breaks out of Earth's atmosphere. Moments later, at a speed that should be impossible, it leaves the solar system. Inside, two indescribable beings look down at a man on a table. Despite forms that defy the human eye's capacity to understand what it sees, they are both wearing lab coats. <laughs> Turns out. They surmise in a language beyond words. They make notes. If we could understand a language that bends time, they'd be saying something like this. The bottom two appendages are for ambulating between chairs. The middle two appendages are for scratching and operating the rectangle. The upper appendage is for observing the rectangle. All evidence indicates that the beings exist to serve the rectangles. The orbs within the upper appendage appear to take in visual information from the rectangle. Thus, it is only logical that the three holes at the front are for absorbing the rectangle through other senses. Is it taste or smell? But what are the flaps on the side for? Are they for deceleration, balance? Are they genitals? And then the indescribable beings realize the flaps serve the most important function of all. The flaps listen to the gargle. The Sonic Glossy Magazine to the Bugle's audio newspaper for a visual world. This is the gargle. All of the news, none of the politics. I am your host, Alice Fraser, and your guest editors for this week's edition of the magazine are James Colley. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, as always, and Alison Spittle. Hello. Oh, that's a much cooler introduction. I want to have that introduction. You Mate, can let's have do it again. I don't uh, know James. <laughs> I think it's Sam, Yo Samity Sam may have originated that. I'm definitely biting off Yo Samity Sam. Well, before we buy our tickets and put on the uh, team scarves of this week's top stories, let's have a look at the front cover of the magazine this week. The front cover is a special Christmas cover saying, uh, Welcome to the Gargle End of Year Gift Guide and Guilty Santa Fantasy, a.k.a. Santasy Roundup. Um, <laughs> I've always been curious as to what Mrs. Claus's first name is. We know nothing about Mrs. Claus mm. other than she's married to Santa Claus. And, you know, it, can, it must be hard being an elf uh, and being Santa in a way. He's a bit like Lizzo. As in, uh, he's known for being jolly. Bad, bad yeah? work practices. Well, this is it. You see, how does Santa have friends up in the North Pole? Everyone is his subordinates. Where does the line go? You know what I mean? I think that's what happened with Lizzo. I think she didn't see people who were working for her as people that were working for her. And saw them as friends who she pays. And oh. uh, never works out well for Santa or for Lisa. Santa Love you would both, be guys. such a good friend, though, because Santa has all of the gossip. Just imagine being like having <laughs> be three wines deep. And you're like, do you want to look at the naughty list? Like, yes, I want to look at yes. the naughty list. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this week's satirical cartoon is the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year, Riz, posing provocatively with its fellow kids. Uh, which is to say words that have lost their meaning by being used too much. Uh, so now they're used to mean everything, like when fascists call other people fascists. <laughs> now it's time for your top story. Top story, sleeping on the job news. And this is the terrifying news that we may soon break the one barrier that has kept us going uh, from day to day, which is that we may now be able to work in our sleep Uh James Colley, I've caught you sleepworking a number of times. Can you unpack this story for us? I've slept through some of the best days in the office. Uh, it's This is a device called Halo from a company called Prophetic, which I believe is ironic because no one involved in the creation of this is ever seeing heaven. Now, uh, so the idea is this is like you are going to lucid dream and in your lucid dream, you are going to be able to solve puzzles and work. And so, so there was a time when like lucid dreaming was supposed to be like a holodeck thing. Like you can be anywhere you want. You can fly. You can do whatever you want. Now they're saying, OK, look yeah sure you can fly but we really need you to work on this excel spreadsheet for the first seven and a half hours of your sleep <laughs> maybe you can take half an hour in between to work on something else but you could get you can, then you can get this Santa. done <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right oh, now we need you to work for your boss who is sleeping a deeper sleep in a nicer bed than you'll ever have <laughs> this is actually this pairs up with um and i don't mean to pitch something right off the top of the show but i had an idea for a show that's kind of like shark tank 
Uh, but what we do is we take startup founders and we push them into an actual shark tank. And then that's the show. <laughs> Look, outside of specifically when I'm on the gargle, I'm a really pro-science person. I'm a really pro-invention person. <laughs> then I come on this show and I feel all I hear about is some bloody nerd saying we have found a way to take the small pleasures in life. If we take them away and crush them into crude oil, we can power a torture device. <laughs> what, uh, once upon a time, like people like Jack Nicholson and stuff would say, I'll sleep when I'm dead as like a cool thing to say when you're partying. Now it's just a possible reprieve in your worker's contract. <laughs> Well, Prophetic describes this device as a non-invasive neurostimulation device, which seems a bit rich for something that is literally invading your dreams. Uh, it is, it, it's such a deeply upsetting idea that I can't, like, I cannot see it as anything other than the opening chapter to a new William Gibson book. Mm -hmm. uh, Alison, are you pro or anti working while you sleep? It is so scary. I've, I've, I think I'm anti it. Like, as a comedian... I did think that I could use my dreams for work, as in, like, uh, I would dream... I, once I had this dream about a dog who was um, a guide dog who then became a CEO of a multinational company, and he got done for, like, a, a pyramid scheme. And um, this is, and for some reason, he, he, he jumped out a window, took an attempt on his life instead of going with the authorities, broke all of his legs and ended up in prison, and then joined um, <laughs> a white supremacist All of group. his legs is a sentence that opens other sentences. <laughs> yes. It's like all of my children, all of my legs, they're gone. But um, he, like, and I wrote that into a stand-up routine, right, about this, about this golden retriever joining. And you always uh, a golden retriever. Yeah, it's always <laughs> a golden just retriever. I, just, I was like, this is, this is a golden retriever and it's going to be called Golden Deceiver. I just... I <laughs> Be amazing that would be yeah no it's a go always golden retrievers do financial fraud like if there's <laughs> any crimes if you to put crimes to different dogs i know xl bullies at the moment they they they've got quite a bad reputation for like gbh and attempted murder but i feel like uh <laughs> golden retrievers definite financial crimes but i wrote this I, I i woke up from the dream and i was compelled i i, I drew pictures i i wrote about like 20 pages about this dog and uh, tried to do it as a stand-up routine was one of the worst deaths I've ever had because people weren't <laughs> willing to I think people were just confused of why 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 would a golden retriever believe in the supremacy of white people like why you know what I mean it was just a very I don't know if the dog really do you did think believe that the that golden or retriever was, is yeah is the white people of dogs Probably, probably it's the white people oh, that does. Can I say, this was a major argument in my household. We have a cavoodle and uh, my partner, who is Aboriginal, wanted to put an Aboriginal print design jacket on the dog. And I said, yes. no, our dog is white. And she said, our dog is not white. Our dog is a dog. Like, it's a cavoodle. It's a cavoodle. It's white. It works in advertising. It's a cavoodle. <laughs> well, it's so strange. So... Anyway, suffice to say, I tried to work in my dreams. Did not work out for the best at all. I've never, I've never thought of a good joke from a dream. I have tried to write down stuff from dreams. But mostly my dreams consist of like me losing my teeth, me stepping out my front door and falling off a cliff into some rocks, or me at my own funeral counting how many people I think would be at my funeral. <laughs> 16. That's the, that's the most I can dream. Not a bad turnout. Yeah. <laughs> Other than answering the question of whether androids dream of electric spreadsheets, uh, <laughs> what do you think this device will offer us, James? I don't know. So I... Um everyone acts like I'm either lying or dead-eyed when I say this, but I don't dream. I've dreamt, like I have, can recall maybe four or five dreams in my whole life. It's Whoa. just not, and I'm treated like a weird freak, and you're doing it now. I'm treated like a weird freak for this, as if your, your vivid delusions about dog crime is fine. <laughs> Someone <laughs> not having that, Whoa, how could you? Like, this is all bizarre to me. And someone saying like, oh, I'm going to go to sleep and be put into work in a horrible sci-fi dystopia is kind of what I guess that this all seems like except you were there and you were there and then suddenly it was an opera house and blah 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 blah, blah. like none of this <laughs> makes any sense to me this is delusion on a delusion in a technocracy I mean 
I, uh, about 40% of my dreams happen in the same extremely extensive dream landscape. Uh, and even Whoa. if it's not in the same location in the dream landscape, I have a map in my head of wh where you would go to get to the other part of what? the dream. So are you lucid dreaming then? That feels like y your dreams are like a mini series. No, I just have very unimaginative to... set dressing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a low budget imagination. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that brings us to our ad section, because you can't be what you can't buy. He was a red-nosed reindeer. She was a groundbreaking, strike-breaking and industry-breaking politician. This summer, Rudolph and Thatcher can love bridge the space between them. A battle to see each other as truly human. A Christmas miracle. A true story. Rudolph and Thatcher. Only in cinemas this Christmas. Like, Margaret Thatcher now, or...? What, what, what point in time? You have to watch the movie is, to see. Is, You'll have um, to find out. In, in Rudolph and Thatcher, is getting coal for Christmas a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. I also realised I said summer and Christmas, which in Australia are the same thing, but nowhere yeah, else in the world. <laughs> that's the correct way, though. It's the correct Christmas. Yeah, yeah Rudolph's got a red nose because he's f***ing <laughs> boiling hot. Um, <laughs> And this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Power. Do you love to break the law but hate going to jail for breaking the law? Try breaking the law while being powerful. Mm. It's likely you'll get a fine. Power, the butter that lubes up the scales of justice. Tis the season. Remember, when you're lining up a plate of Christmas treats or serving up your bowl of anti-Christmas battle fuel in the mess tent of the army of the war against Christmas, it is impossible to digest most of this food without at least half a glass of water to wash it down. Half a glass of water. Food lube. And that brings us to our next top story. Our next top story is chicken sandwich news. And this is the news that uh, an Australian border control has fined a, a Kiwi grandmother $3,300 for bringing a sandwich through border control. Uh, Alison Spittle, you've smuggled some uh, chicken sandwiches through borders <laughs> in your time. Can you unpack this story for us? I act, well, like, what have I... I'm trying to think of stuff that I've smuggled. I've definitely... I've smuggled, like, uh, alcohol into festivals by adding another gut uh, of, like, uh, I get the I get the bladder of a... This is this is one for you, kids. Get the bladder of a, of a, of a box of wine and fill it with any alcohol of your choice and put it at the front of your body and just, uh, yeah, let them try and touch you, man. They can't do anything. <laughs> anyway, June Armstrong... <laughs> 77 year old Canterbury woman she was uh, she went to Brisbane airport and she was fined right after eating an uneaten uh, chicken sandwich it's 3,300 quid which is quite a lot of money I'm very surprised it was a Kiwi woman that did this I, as an Irish person I watched a lot of Border Patrol that was shown in Ireland uh, quite a lot the Australian <laughs> uh, TV show Border Patrol mm -hmm. uh, basically to teach us lads we, we, we watched Border Patrol and Bondi Beach Border Patrol was to teach us to not overstay our visas Bondi Beach was to teach us to put on sun cream uh, because we as Irish people who go to Australia we absolutely get destroyed if you see a pink person in an Australian uh, documentary they're Irish uh, we still haven't learned <laughs> but um, yeah this woman basically it has to pay uh, for, for, for bringing in a chicken sandwich um, she forgot that she had it in her bag she brought it in and uh, being charged quite a lot of money I love this um, I love this the element of grandmother you know that gets brought into stuff grandmother is always brought up when it's a fine you know or they have to go to prison or um, you know the bins haven't come out in time they always bring up the grandmother as if like they shouldn't go uh, to prison or shouldn't get a fine and the pictures that they have are great as well it's of June just uh, frustratedly looking at a phone beside her fine it's very uh, the, the, this reminds me of kind of late 90s kind of um, late 90s news, pro news uh, stories where you'd have a wronged person beside a pothole or beside a bad, 
a bad Christmas theme park or something like that, you know? But this is beside a <laughs> fine. You are so right about the grandmother issue because all it tells you is that this old lady you're looking at banged once yes! at some point in history. And then her child banged again, you know? Once a week, yep. she might help out. <laughs> you, you're both us. You're both like... Oh. I am so waiting to go in on this. I am so... <laughs> Nearly, but like, you both are from, from places that, uh, you know, have strong kind of laws about their biodiversity and stuff. Yes, uh, we do. T- tell us about, like, why why is it so strong? Like, oh, what? well, here we go. I, I ju- <laughs> I'm crack the knuckles. Let's get into this. No sympathy, no mercy. Uh, Ped, get the bleep button ready. Not even oh, she's a grandmother. grandmother. She's bad. Last time, we left, last time we let white meat in uninspected, it took over the country. So let's... <laughs> Look, the late great Steve Irwin said, quarantine matters, don't muck with it. And this woman mucked with it. You know who covered this story? The crime reporter. Because this is a criminal matter. The flagrant importation of chickens from a country known to be harboring flightless birds. You expect me to have sympathy for the flouting of the biosecurity of this proud nation? We are Australians. We take our chicken sandwiches very, very seriously. We cannot have our prized chicken sandwiches diluted with the piffle brought in from New Zealand. Are there chickens in New Zealand? I don't know. I don't care to know. If they were, would they be called chuckens? I would quite like to know that, but otherwise I don't really know. I know I'm supposed to be sad because she cried in an airport, but we all cry in Brisbane airport that's what happens when you realize you're in Brisbane that's just part of the game sorry no sympathy done don't muck with it and now it's time for your reviews as you know each week we ask our guest editors to bring in something to review out of five stars Uh, James Colley what have you brought in for us this week um, we've actually been reviewing this together, Alice. I'm reviewing Moving House. Now, um, I've been going through this for a few weeks now, and everyone always talks about the bad sides of Moving House, the stressful sides, but there are positives. Um, you get to talk to real estate agents all the time, which means any other conversation <laughs> you have that day is a real improvement. Uh, you, you completely lose your fear of your house burning down and all your possessions disappearing. It actually becomes somewhat of a fantasy. Uh, it's, it's actually a lot better than people think. Um, in fact, all in all, I give Moving House... Uh, oh, Christ, I left my star rating somewhere here. That's in one of the boxes. Uh, <laughs> forget it, two stars. Beautiful. Alison, what have you brought in for us this week? So last week I told you I was on House of Games and I wasn't going to review it until the whole thing had come out. So House of Games is a is a TV program on BBC Two, The Sun Every Day, and it's where you do quizzing. I'm a big fan of quizzing. I love I love uh, trivia and stuff like that. And uh, I I entered it. It's it's probably the program I want to be on most. Maybe Taskmaster, but like that that is up there for me. So I was delighted. And uh, I won I won some prizes. I'm gonna show you the prizes. So this is a dartboard and this is a toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> I won them, but you can you can win the whole week if you if you do um, if you, if you win three days in a row. And I got pipped to the post at the last day, and I got two questions wrong that would be seared into my brain forever. What what now, are they? Um, so it's this thing called answer <laughs> smash, which is like um, the last round of every every day. And I've never I've never perfected it. You know, I do well at the other stuff. Uh, but I've never perfected Answer Smash. So they showed a picture of, um, they said comedy duos and they had a picture of uh, French and Saunders. And the question above it says, uh, which Girls Aloud song uh, came out in blah, 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 blah. And it was, uh, the Girls Aloud song is, uh, I can't speak French. But I said, I don't speak French and Saunders. And they minus the point, it's very harsh. And then the next one, this is the question, and I want to hear your answers to this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is, in Shakespeare, what do the free witches say before and trouble, right? And, uh, and then the picture is a picture of a toilet seat. So you have to smash those answers together. So hubble, bubble, toilet, trouble, is that what really? What did you say? 
Oh, my bad. I'm about to lose a point. I can feel. But what it. did you say? Yeah. Hubble bubble toilet trouble. I said hubble bubble. I said hubble bubble as well. I don't know where this is coming to the ether, but it's it's apparently double double toilet trouble. I think that's oh, disgraceful. Man. Shakespeare's so, a hack. So hubble bubble. I said hubble bubble. I thought I was right. I was on the cusp of winning. No, I was wrong. I lost the whole thing. Clive Anderson got the trophy. I nearly cried. I had to put my face into my t-shirt <laughs> and I have a word of myself. I made it weird. I know I made it weird. My <laughs> I made it weird for everyone else. And I've just, I just ruined a good time by not knowing enough about Shakespeare. And I'm dis- disgusted. Wherever I got Hubble Bubble from, I don't know. This is why before every performance, I walk around backstage going, Macbeth, 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 <laughs> just so I have it in my head. <laughs> It truly is bad luck. So I'm giving it four out of five because it was my dream that came true. But I'm minus in one. Not not for losing, but for for losing in that way and feeling that strongly about it and letting it be on camera. Like I'm, it's, it's not about losing, Alice. It's about, it's about losing badly. Do you know what I mean? I, I love that, that. It's not whether you win or lose. It's that you try. But in your case, it's a negative well, it's, it's, it's not whether you win or lose, but if it's if you lose, do you emotionally make other people feel... They all looked at me at the side, you know? I, I, my whole... My back arched in discomfort, right? I couldn't sit on that table. I couldn't sit in that chair properly. I absolutely made a show of myself. But anyway, I got a dartboard and a, t- and a toolbox out of it. Uh, I but like, I don't have you, my pride. You got you got so upset you turned into a divorced dad and had to take a dartboard and a toolbox home. <laughs> yeah. I'm building my own man cave. I'm building them. On the bright side, Alison, yeah. if uh, if the business prophetic has anything to do with it, you'll be able to do your dream job seven nights a week now when you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know what? I did have a nightmare last week that I was at House Games. I've been told show off the prizes, so here. Like this dartboard, <laughs> I love it, but I live in rented accommodation. I cannot put this up. <laughs> I'm not going to get rid of my deposit because I tell you now, my aim is not good. That's a great <laughs> higher stakes version of darts in a house where you want to get the bond back. That's a fantastic one. <laughs> Genuinely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That brings us to our next top story, uh, which is Gen Z germaphobes. Apparently, uh, a huge proportion of Generation Z wash their hands uh, way more than I would I would think necessary. Forty seven percent of Gen Z people who were studied in this particular study say they wash their hands five to ten times a day. Alison, yes. you're a very clean person. Can you unpack this story for us? Basically, these students are clean. They've surveyed them. Thirty-three uh, percent of them, I think, wa- wash their bed sheets once a week, which is crazy. D- no, no, that one's fine. That's the bit what? where I was like, that you change your bed sheets once a week, and uh, that's fine. Change your bed sheets. That's just clean. Okay, maybe we differ here. How, how maybe... often do you change your bed sheets, my friend? When the and I'll remind changes. you, you are being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think I think whether you how often you change your bed sheets depends on how uh, much pajamas you wear. That's true. So if you oh, go to bed I... in the nude, I feel like once a week is the move. But if you're you know going to sleep in a, a full hooded onesie, then probably once a month is fine. <laughs> I like I I look. I'm very strident about changing the sheets once a week, but I do shit the bed every night, so it kind of. <laughs> evens out <laughs> yeah I, I wear a full Grinch suit going to bed so you know <laughs> once a month for me it's fine but um, they, they, it's it's funny they, they, they survey these students about uh, cleanliness and it actually goes to show that um, colleges are disgusting uh, mm-hmm. the tables are uh, full of germs everything is full of germs it's a very odd also there is a mention as well of uh, shared bathrooms and uh, bodily fluid and like to me this is why I wear I wear um, I wear flip flops everywhere I do not trust I, I live with lots of people I've always lived with lots of people 
and uh, you just can't trust bathrooms. I bring, I bring my toothbrush with me to my bedroom. I don't keep it in the bathroom. My boyfriend says it's paranoid, but like I don't know. I just, I, I love my flatmates, but I just, I just can't leave my toothbrush in a public place. It feels. <laughs> am I a germaphobe? Or am I just No, that seems entirely reasonable and sane. Do you know why? It's because I have this other podcast where people confess stuff and the amount of like arguments that have been solved by someone putting a, a toothbrush in an orifice is just, <laughs> it scared me. Do you know what I mean? It has scared me. Keep your toothbrushes in your own area. Keep an eye on them. <laughs> I reckon, I think, uh, like, I read this about Gen Z being germaphobes, and I think it's, look, it's pretty understandable after two world wars and the rising right to be scared of the Germans. But as a German myself, I think that, you know, we've changed. It's not the same. I don't think germaphobia is the answer. But I think my true feelings about this is whenever I res- read results like this of a survey about Gen Z, I think that what it says about Gen Z is that more than any generation previous, they are entirely comfortable lying to people who take surveys because they understand (laughs) that the only people who read these surveys are their mum's generation. So all of their answers are like, yeah, we don't drink. We never have sex anyway. I wash my hands 40 times a week and my room is immaculate. (laughs) Mum, if you're reading this mum, these are the results you need to know. And that brings us to our final story of the week. Uh, This is the incredibly complicated issue of who gets to decide what what flavours of chip go to which country. And by chip, I mean crisp. And by crisp, I mean small flat potato thing. Don't make me do the translation work for you. Uh, James Colley, you have strong opinions on the flavours of chips. Can you unpack this story for us? I can, to the degree that the first note I had on this is... And I quote, firstly, chips. They are chips. <laughs> Thank you for being right there. <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with this concept. This is a really, really great long read. This is a really good read to have. And it's about like how, it's partly about like how you create these great dishes. It's about how different nations eat chips like when you have them and therefore what kind of palate you need there are some places where it's a before dinner treat there are some where it's a cocktail treat there's america where it's just on the side of sandwiches what is going on there are you six <laughs> what is that um but i so i've been obsessed with everything about chip marketing so long that um also is this but i work on a show in australia that is about advertising and marketing and we we dissect how advertising and marketing works on us and I was so obsessed with the concept of how do you decide the colors that each flavor gets? I got very obsessed with this to the point that I produced one of the worst stories we've ever done. But I would like to (laughs) derail the whole show to ask Alison, what color is chicken? Oh, it kind of like orangey amber to me. That's disgusting to me. Chicken is green. What color is salt and vinegar? Chicken is green. Salt vinegar blue. No, it's purple. Disgusting. How very dare you. No. Blue is plain. Yeah, blue is plain. <laughs> Wait, you're perverts. I don't want to kink shame you of your, <laughs> your crisp color choice, but no. Blue is vinegar. Vinegar is like vinegary water. It, it's no, blue. Vinegar is purple. It pops. It's vinegar. Blue is oh a calming God. original. A calming <laughs> original. Say. Well, what color is cheese and onion then? Yellow, Jeez. obviously. No, it's the red. Cheese and not what? Red is tomato occasionally when it's being used as a special flavour. Tomato. This yeah, is... we have meat pie and tomato sauce flavours. We don't want to go into it. We're not super proud of that area of it, but that's the kind of colour you're expecting. <laughs> oh my god, this is this is no, Isn't this it is fascinating? Oh. And wouldn't you be surprised if this made the fifteen worst minutes of television of your career? Because it is a fascinating <laughs> topic. <laughs> You know I'm going to Google this straight after. <laughs> straight after. Well, like, maybe, because I'm from Ireland originally, and uh, we, this is this is what I heard anecdotally, and now that I read that uh, long read, which is an amazing article, by the way, like one of the best reads I've had in mm-hmm. a while. Investigative Thank journalism. Thank you. I like to choose at least best. one story where the co-hosts have to do actual work. <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
<laughs> but like uh, in Ireland, uh, we 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 fought. We think we invented flavored crisps, like uh, that cheese and onion flavor. Well, we invented that. Apparently, I could be proven wrong. And then um, we have a we have a theme park dedicated to crisps. Uh, it's called Tato Land. Can and I ask all- a question about yeah. Irish chips? which is going to come across Crisps. unbelievably insane if I'm wrong, and it's chips, but it will come across unbelievably, <laughs> which is that in in the northern and in the south, there are different chip brands that have the same name and both parties are very passionate that theirs is better. Babes, I'm so glad you asked, because in my presentation, I will show you. Um, so <laughs> there's a, there's this, there's, there is a... Um, there's a theme park dedicated to crisps and potatoes in general. It's called Tato Land. And this is inspired by a person called Mr. Tato. Now, <laughs> there, there, Tato is an, uh, an all-island brand. As we know, uh, due to colonialism, uh, Ireland is split into two. I won't go into far, too far into that, but I can talk about the crisps. <laughs> and um, there, there That's all right. Due to colonialism, Australia is one. <laughs> but but Mr. Tato, there's two different types of Mr. Tato. Uh, one is the I'll show you the Republic of Ireland, Mr. Tato. You can um, you can you can you can tell me what he looks like to your eyes. Okay? I think the answer just beforehand is going to be one looks Catholic and the other looks Protestant. Then oh, genuinely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this Republic of Ireland Tato. <laughs> Uh, for the listeners at home, he's wearing striped trousers, a red jacket, uh, a little hat, and a facial expression that can only say, "I am made out of potato, and I'm happy about it." Right? That's him. He's 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 a potato in a jacket. It's beautiful. Now, the Northern Irish Tato is here. This is him. <laughs> As we see, this morning. That is a Protestant. Jawline. That is a Protestant potato if I've ever seen. Them. That is a Protestant potato. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, there's a more prominent jawline. The cheeks are rosy. There's a, you know, there's a bit more detail. Crow's feet as well indicates age. Um, now, I may be, I may be. Um, I may be betraying my country uh, as a person from the Republic of Ireland, but uh, if I had to, if I had to ride either of those uh, potato lads, that's the Republic of Ireland one, and then there's the Northern Ireland one. I'm going to go for the Northern Ireland one every time. Look at that face, right? <laughs> he's got a prominent, he's got a prominent jaw. It, it just, it just, it just says to me, bad boy. You know what I mean? Yeah, but see, that's that's exactly what I was going to say. I yeah. was going to say, Alison Spittle, you have unwholesome tastes. I would say the other the other potato says, uh, I'm going to look after you. Like I'll, yeah, I may not be the most exciting prospect, but you know, <laughs> I'll make sure that dinner's on the table. And uh, I know, but the other one says to me, like, you know, I'm going to cover you in crisp dust and just leave you there. You know, this is, <laughs> this is the exact <laughs> argument that ends in a terrible mashing all along the border. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i um i i do i do i do fancy the northern irish state of man more I'm, I'm so glad that you knew about that because i really felt like i was uh i was gonna derail this whole i didn't know how i was gonna crowbar the mr tato man in but i got it in thank you thank you so much um but it's weird in ireland we have this thing called buffalo flavored crisps um that are buffalo not buffalo flavored we have barbecue flavored. Would that be a, what color is a buffalo crisp? It, now that is a kind of amber, and it has pictures of buffaloes on it. And when I was a kid, I thought it was actual buffaloes being used to make the crisps. But I liked the crisps that much; I was able to like get over that. There's a complex system of like uh, social science and culinary science that goes into where gets what kind of flavor of crisp, yes. which is one of the fascinating things about this article. For example, you can get lasagna flavored chips in Thailand, but not in Italy. Yeah, and they said that Thai flavored, so there's Thai sweet chili flavor, which is a popular flavor in the UK. And that was brought in 2002. And that, that they only brought that in because there were more Thai restaurants in the UK at that time, like, uh, they had the flavouring before, but at the time there was so little uh, Thai restaurants in the UK that then the time was right. Isn't it mad? It's not only just That's... countries, but it's also like when the timing is right that they, they decide what flavours go for which country. 
enough of this culture's taste buds have come awake that we can introduce them to this new taste. We kind of have an infantilized version of this as well because they don't go like uh, most of Australian chips don't give you a like you know oh it's it's a lasagna or it's a Thai sweet they barbecue to barbecue this one's light it's a bit tangy we're gonna call it light and tangy we don't really go into like <laughs> <laughs> ah the flavors of Thailand. <laughs> oh I remember once Walkers did like a a flavour competition and they were representing different countries or was that best of British it was best of British but they had um, they had a a, a, a full English breakfast flavour and I ate it it tasted like egg that was the predominant flavouring in it it was perverted it was wrong <laughs> it was definitely the most disgusting thing I've ever had in my life um, but it is amazing how different countries like have different types of crisps France only have plain flavoured crisps because they That's see so crisps French. as like a. I know the French, they're, they're so like uh, sophisticated even when it comes to crisps because they're like they only want light flavors because they would have it as an aperitif before a meal, not like me, yeah. which is that uh, crisps are stand up comedian fuel because mm. you end up at a, a petrol station at half eleven at night. You haven't eaten dinner, so you think, oh, I'll have a packet of Monster Munch and Quavers, get all of the different proteins in me off these crisps, you know? <laughs> where, where the French just have two, and then they enjoy the new Polanski movie. <laughs> yes, they're so, they can separate the art from the artist and the flavour from the crisp, you know? <laughs> And that brings us to the end of today's uh, magazine. I'm flipping through the ad section at the back. Alison, have you got anything to plug? I got a play on called Glacier. It's on until the 23rd of December in the old firehouse in Oxford. I got a, a tour coming out called Soup in the new year. And uh, there, uh, I'm doing a run of Soup in Soho Theatre. Come along to that. Yeah, it's going to be great crack so jealous if I were anywhere near the UK I'd be coming to both of those things so go on my behalf uh, James Colley what have you got to plug uh, I have a book coming out in a couple months it is called The Next Big Thing it is about big things and includes a reference to the Robertson Big Potato which you could make into a series of crisps not to be confused with the big spud in Hobart we don't talk about that that's a lesser big potato that's trying to usurp the Robertson big potato that is also colloquially known as the big turd sometimes because it really does look like a big turd anyway uh, it's a rom-com it comes out very soon in all good bookstores provided you're in Australia I'm sure there are good bookstores elsewhere in the world hopefully it will come out there soon I would say go in and hassle the minimum wage staff worker until they get it in uh, and other than that, uh, if you are also in Australia, everything I do is geo-blocked. So if I, if, this is why all of my material is fine to just slag off any other nation because <laughs> <laughs> nothing I make goes outside of this island. <laughs> uh, Question Everything is on ABC TV, 8.30 Wednesdays. Our final episode is coming up. It's been a really good season, so go back and watch it. And uh, you can find me online at patreon.com slash Alice Fraser, where I, won, I run now twice weekly a writer's meeting. If you're writing something, if you're working on something, join us. It's a, it's a, it's a blast twice a week. I also do salons. I've also got um, various comedy specials coming out there uh, in the next couple of months. I also have a book. Go to unbound.com and uh, type in my name, Alice Fraser, and you will find the Dancy Lagarde reader will become available at some point i've done my writing bit it's it's in their hands now uh, this is a bugle podcast and alice fraser production your editor is ped hunter your executive producer is chris skinner i'll talk to you again next week you can listen to other programs from the bugle including the bugle catharsis tiny revolutions top stories and the gargle wherever you find your podcasts